Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Rick Olson, and I'm the Senior Advisor with the Asia Center at the U.S. Institute of Peace. We are delighted to be partnering with the Kakar History Foundation and the Heart of Asia Society for today's launch of their new book, In Search of Peace for Afghanistan, Historical Letters of President Najibullah and Dr. M. Hassan Kakar, a collection of essays. <clears throat> this collection offers critical analysis of this historic correspondence and the period following the withdrawal of Soviet troops in the late 1980s and draws lessons for current day Afghanistan as the country attempts to reach a settlement to end over four decades of violent conflict. Uh, <clears throat> let me begin with a quick housekeeping note. We invite all of you to take part in today's discussion by asking questions using the chat box function located just below the video player on the USIP event page. We ask that you please include your name and specify where you are joining us from in your questions. And you can engage with us and each other on Twitter with today's hashtag at Afghan Peace. The U.S. Institute of Peace was founded by the U.S. Congress over 35 years ago as an independent, nonpartisan national institute charged with the vital mission of preventing, mitigating, and resolving violent conflicts under the premise that peace is possible. The need for peace is more critical than ever. In recent weeks, countless attacks against civilians across Afghanistan, particularly the horrific bombing on a girls' school in Dashti Barchi neighborhood of Kabul, and the relentless fighting between the Afghan forces and the Taliban underscore the importance of a political settlement and a ceasefire. Supporting an inclusive peace process is a core priority of USIP's Afghanistan program. We believe a negotiated political settlement between the key parties is the only way to reach a sustainable end to over four decades of violent conflict. Through our office in Kabul, USIP engages in both national and local level efforts for peace, equipping Afghan peace builders with the skills to advance their interests through dialogue and nonviolent strategies. This is achieved through our peace education program in universities across the country, activities to enhance rule of law and women's inclusion in the peace process, subnational peace dialogues, and many other projects. In Washington, USIP supports a wide range of US, Afghan, and international stakeholders through high level consultations, research, and policy analysis. The current time parallels uh, the, the, uh, the period when Najibullah and Professor Kakar wrote their letters in 1990. In some cases, the parallels are distressing. Once again, international forces are leaving Afghanistan while conflict rages. The level of future international engagement is uncertain, as is the answer to the question of whether key regional actors will help prolong the conflict or help to bring peace and stability. It was against this backdrop that the Kakara History Foundation and the Heart of Asia Society published this excellent collection of essays earlier this month, which features contributions from many leading US, Afghan, and international experts and stakeholders, including current and former USIP colleagues. We are excited to have some of the contributing authors with us today for a discussion on the lessons for current day Afghanistan from the letters and the post-Soviet period, including Omar Sharifi, Omar Sadr, Robert Cruz, and from USIP, Balkis Ahmadi and Dipali Mudakadpai. Dipali will serve as our moderator. Following the discussion and quest, uh, following the question and answer session, there will be closing remarks by Ambassador Janan Musasai co-founder of the Heart of Asia Society and a former ambassador of Afghanistan to Pakistan and to China. But first, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Ambassador Lakhdar Brahimi, who wrote the foreword for the book, as well as Kalan Kakar, who will provide brief remarks before the panel discussion begins. I scarcely need to introduce Ambassador Lakhdar Brahimi to this audience. He has held many distinguished posts throughout his diplomatic career, including Foreign Minister of Algeria, 
UN Special Representative in Afghanistan from 2001 to 2004, UN Special Envoy in Iraq in 2004, and Joint Special Representative of the UN and the Arab League for Syria 2012-2014. He is perhaps the foremost practitioner of peacebuilding in our time. He has worked to end conflicts around the world and had a long and important history of working to bring peace to Afghanistan. Kawan Kakar is Executive Director of the Kakar History Foundation and founder and managing partner of Kakar Advocates Law Firm. He has worked previously for the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan and as an advisor to the constitutional lawyer Jirga that adopted the 2004 Constitution. He has also served as an advisor and deputy chief of staff to then President Hamid Karzai. So at this point, I would like to invite Ambassador Brahimi to provide the keynote address to our audience. Over to you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador, and I'm extremely grateful to Yusip uh, and the uh, uh, Kakar Foundation and uh, the Heart of Asia uh, Foundation for inviting me to be with you today. I, I very much regret that I've accepted to give you the, uh, uh, the uh, keynote speech. My remarks will not be a keynote speech because I really don't know what to say. Um, I have been away from Afghanistan and uh, Afghanistan's problems and discussions and debates and so on since January uh, 2004. I went back once to Kabul for a couple of nights uh, in 2010. That's all. I keep in touch with a few uh, people and uh, try to listen and understand. But that's not enough to deliver to you a keynote speech. So please consider it as a few remarks of, uh, of an interested uh, old man, uh, you know, following what you are all doing and with a great deal of uh, respect and admiration. Um, First, you know, about the book, I'm really, you know, full of admiration and respect uh, to uh, Kaun and all the people who have uh, helped him uh, make this book become a reality. Here you have, you know, a wealth of experience, which is not only for, you know, people are sitting around this virtual table, but perhaps most for the people who are trying to negotiate now, peace at last for Afghanistan. They will not find the recipe uh, to make a success of their negotiations, but they will find, uh, you know, if they are wise enough, they will find a lot of lessons uh, of uh, success and probably more of failures for them to uh, you know, look back and see how they can do better than all the people who preceded them over the last 40 years. By the way, it's not 40 years, it's 50 years that Afghanistan has been in trouble. But at least uh, 1973, the uh, country was destabilized when uh, Dawood, Sardar Dawood went for his uh, coup d'etat against his cousin. Uh, it's from there to this day that Afghanistan has continued to be destabilized. It, it, it has not been easy and it will not be easy to uh, uh, make things right. Uh, so this is, this is uh, you know, this is uh, something that they will, they will, they will find they will find in, in, in the book if they care to uh, to look at, you know, just pick up almost any uh, contribution and you will, you will, you will learn uh, much, much from it. Um, uh, the, the, the second point I would like to make is, 
uh, those who are uh, negotiating uh, today should remember that uh, you know, no matter how strong you think you are, especially in Afghanistan, no matter how many battles you win, the, the others will come back at you. And nobody should know that better than the Taliban. In 2001, uh, they controlled 95% of the country. All their adversaries were physically out of Afghanistan, except for Ahmed Shah Massoud, who was at a very little corner of, uh, of uh, Northwest uh, Afghanistan. And where are they today? Or where were they? Uh, uh, in uh, in October 2001, and where were the Taliban in 2001? Defeated, scattered, uh, all over the country and all over the region. So if they think that they are going to win today, uh, maybe maybe they have the capability, also. but uh, you know that will not be achieving peace. It will be achieving victory for a time. This is not what Afghanistan needs. This is not what the Taliban or anybody sitting around that table in Doha needs. What they need is peace. And peace is, is a complicated business, difficult to achieve. Uh, it needs time. You know, if, if they think that the fact that the Americans will leave in July uh, is the end of the story. They, they are absolutely wrong. Uh, anybody who thinks that is absolutely wrong. Maybe the Americans will go and will not come back. But in, in our world today, uh, nobody lives in an island and definitely not Afghanistan. They have neighbors, those neighbors have interests. Uh, they have likes, they have dislikes. Uh, and they have friends in, inside, in, in, inside Afghanistan. So, you know, how can this message be conveyed to the people who take decisions in, uh, in Afghanistan? The Taliban, the government, the other parties. Uh, you know, there is something that is uh, not very good for Afghanistan. The same people have been at it for now uh, at least 30 years. But what is good is that they have accumulated experience. If every individual that is involved today in, in, in the decision making in places where it matters have been around for you know, 20 years at least, 30 years, 40 years. Uh, so they, they should know, uh, and they should be reminded of uh, what it is about. When we were fighting against the French in the uh, 1950s and early 1960s, when at long last the French accepted the idea of negotiating with us, they offered us a ceasefire. They said, let's have a ceasefire. And uh, you know, negotiate. That it's better for everybody to negotiate while the ceasefire was on. But we were much too weak to accept the ceasefire. So we insisted that we should, uh, you know, we should continue to fight while the negotiation is taking place. And at the end, it worked for us. Um, there is the temptation to say the same thing today is fully understandable and, and nobody will understand it better than me. Uh, but perhaps it's not what Afghanistan is needed, their needs. Uh, now it is practically uh, understood and accepted that uh, 
peace is for the Afghans uh, to make, not, not for others. Yeah, maybe, you know, there will be hanging around, there will be, with a lot of influence also in some cases, uh, but still it's the Afghans who are going to make peace. Negotiations between them, I think it's great if negotiations take a long time, not a short time. But for that to happen, it will be so much better and so much easier if uh, they have a solid provisional uh, ceasefire. These are, you know, these are some of the of the points I wanted to to make at, at the beginning. I may I may come back, you know, if you ask me questions or if I also think of uh, something else uh, to say. The bottom line is, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think the Afghans can can uh, complain that uh, promises have been made to them that have not been kept. Uh, that the Americans are, you know, giving up without. Uh, Without really, without really discussing this properly with their Afghan partners, uh, but this was is bound to happen one day. You know, uh, you know. I, I kept repeating to the Iraqis when I was there for those six months in two thousand and four that you know the Americans. Whatever you think of what they have done, uh, uh, and I happen to think that what they did was really uh, not acceptable. But they will live one day, and most probably sooner than later. So, uh, you know, it, it happens that I don't know why they went to Iraq in the first place, but they did go to Iraq. They have done all the harm they could. Maybe they did uh, some good also. Maybe they didn't. But one day they will. They will. They will go away. Peace has to be made between you Iraqis. Uh, Ninety-five percent of the Iraqis wanted to get rid of uh, Saddam Hussein. Americans got rid of him for you. That didn't come without a price, but it happened. Now it's up to you to. To, to create to a country that is better than that. So, in, I mean, the Afghans have, are in, in a similar situations, although the background is totally different. Uh, in July, the Americans will most probably uh, have no military uh, role anymore. But it's up to you now, all of you. Uh, you know, the government, the other parties, uh, younger generation like uh, uh, Kaun and, uh, and, uh, and, and Janan and the others who are around this table, it's up to you now to, uh, to uh, at long last, put an end to these 50 years of instability and wars in your country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador uh, Brahimi. So I think uh, next on the agenda is Kawan. Please, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, um, thank you for those very wise words, um, Mr. Brahimi. I'm also very grateful to USIP for taking the lead in organizing this event and to be included among such distinguished panelists. In a few minutes that I have, I'll provide, try to provide a background and a few thoughts on the edited volume in search of peace for Afghanistan, which I hope everyone concerned with Afghanistan will have a chance to read. Uh, as was mentioned, the volume is inspired by the discovery in 2019 of three letters exchanged between uh, President Najibullah and historian Dr. Mohammad Hassan Kakar in 1990, a year after the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan. In these letters, both Najibullah and Kakar exchanged views on ways to achieve an end to the then internationalized conflict in Afghanistan. They touch on several themes that seem so relevant with the debates taking place today as Afghanistan enters a post 
U.S. withdrawal stage. First, the letters include a spirited discussion about the, about the mechanics of how Afghans could structure and transition from war to peacemaking. Both sides agree that Afghans must search for a political rather than a military solution to the conflict. They also point to the dire consequences and ultimately to the futility of a military approach. Second, both Najibullah and Kakar point to the internationalized nature of the conflict and recognize that war cannot end in Afghanistan without the active support of the regional and international actors. Uh, for example, Kakar singles out Soviet Union in Pakistan at that time of being as half of the problem and thus half of the potential solution to Afghanistan. The letters, interestingly, also include a far-sighted observations about the defects of the Geneva Accords, which formed the basis of the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan. They discuss the violations of the same accords by foreign countries. The results, as we know now, were catastrophic, foremost for the Afghans, but also disastrous far beyond. The volume is a collection of 22 essays in English on various themes of the letters written by Afghans and international scholars and peace experts. And they're divided into three key areas. I'd just like to mention them. They focus on the correspondence and draw similarities and differences between the previous and the current peace process. And part two deals with the state society relations, such as the state formation, nation building, party system, and post 9 11 society and developments in Afghanistan. And finally, part three deals with the roles of non Afghans, regional, state, and non state actors and of the wider international community and provides comparative examples of successful, peaceful negotiations and best international practices. As was mentioned, the purpose of publication of this uh, edit volume is to have lessons learned so that those mistakes are not repeated and that we have a sustainable peace in Afghanistan. I will end with a couple of thoughts on, uh, on the volume itself. That number one, even though Afghanistan has been known for over four and now, as Mr. Brahimi said, even close to five decades of war, there have been many attempts of peace, especially by Afghans, but albeit unsuccessful, but that they need to be studied and to be learned from. Today, again, Afghans are overwhelmingly in support of peace and coexistence. Even those currently engaged in the conflict express strong desire for peace. Afghans have to find a way to translate the strong desire into practical steps in a structure of governance for a transition from war to peace. They have to reach out to each other, as Najibullah and Kakar did, even when they disagreed. Second, and perhaps, and I'll end on this one, the regional and international dynamics and environment must also become conducive and supportive for peace in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is in a strategic location, which should be its asset has become a liability due to the intense regional and global competition, rivalries, and even proxy wars. Unless the region genuinely commits to peace in Afghanistan and the international community, in particular in the US and countries in Europe support it, and specific actors recognize their interest in a sovereign and peaceful Afghanistan, peace cannot come to Afghanistan, I think period. In other words, actual and sustainable peace in Afghanistan must also become a regional and international priority, which unfortunately currently does not seem to be the case, despite many claims otherwise. So far, there are many debates and even agreements about many side issues, but not about the peace itself in Afghanistan. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Coach. <laughs> It is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to a conversation with a group of remarkable scholars and practitioners who are joining us from Afghanistan and from the United States to celebrate the launch of this collection of essays. Uh, as a longtime student of Afghanistan, it is my personal joy to recognize the groundbreaking work of Professor Hassan Kakar and to pay tribute to the moral courage of a scholar whose willingness to speak truth to power meant he was sent to prison. 
Um, and it makes that, you know, nothing short of remarkable then that a few years later, he set aside the pain and bitterness of that experience in order to advise the very government that had jailed him on how to save itself from collapse. It's also worth noting how unusual it is for men of power, let alone heads of state, to turn to others, for counsel to seek lessons on the culture and history of people in order to make better decisions for their future. And that is, in effect, what President Najib did. Decades later, a group of scholars and practitioners led by Professor Javon Shir Rasik came together from a sorry, I hope you can hear me, came together from across the world to see what lessons we could learn from this exchange between a professor and a president. Uh, for me, Dr. Kakar's letter offered a set of grave warnings and critiques, but also several rays of hope for the current <laughs> moment. He acknowledged the disproportionate impact of international agendas and actions on the inner political life of Afghanistan, but he also urged the country's leaders to conceive politics in accommodationist, expansion, and in terms. As American troops withdraw from Afghanistan, the scene could not be more different in many ways. Uh, I'm just going to drop my video in case it's my internet. That's a problem. Um, as American troops withdraw from Afghanistan, this scene could not be more different in, in several ways that we will discuss today. But the tensions between intervention and self-determination, between dependence and sovereignty, struggle and reconciliation all persist. So we are fortunate to have this opportunity to think through these tensions with a blessed opening from Ambassador Brahimi, no less. So let me now introduce our panel in the order they will speak. Professor Omar Sadr is joining us from Kabul, Assistant Professor at American University of Afghanistan. Previously, he worked at the American Institute for Strategic Studies and at the National Center for Policy Research at Kabul University. He earned a doctorate from South Asian University, and we're delighted to have him with us. Robert Cruz is a professor of history at Stanford University, whose research and teaching interests focus on Afghanistan, Central and South Asia, Russia, Islam, and global history. A graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and Columbia University, he earned his PhD at Princeton. He is currently editor-in-chief of the journal Afghanistan, which is published by the American Institute of Afghan Studies and Edinburgh University Press. Belkis Ahmadi is peace builder and human rights advocate with more than two decades of experience promoting the rule of law, human rights, gender equality, and good governance. She is currently with the United States Institute of Peace as a senior program officer, where she works on peace building and rule of law in Afghanistan. And finally, Omar Sharifi is assistant professor of anthropology at the American University of Afghanistan and the senior research fellow and Kabul director of the American Institute of Afghan Studies. A graduate of Columbia University, he earned his PhD at Boston University in cultural anthropology. So I'm going to see if I can bring my video back on here. And Omar Sadr, I'm going to start with you. This book, as we've discussed, is a volume of essays that reflect on letters exchanged between a president I'm sorry. I wonder if you can talk a bit a role about the role of the public intellectual for us in today's Afghanistan, Omar. Uh, you've written in particular about the need for a deeper discourse and debate around what it means for Afghanistan to be a republic. 
Can you share with us what is the state of that debate and discourse today and how does it connect with politics? And do you think a kind of public consciousness around the value and the content of the Republic has advanced far enough to ward off the return of the Emirate or a collapse into civil war? Please talk to us about the work that remains to be done and how do you do that work in the face of relentless violence and uncertainty? Thank you, Dr. Dipali. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Good evening from Kabul. Um, first of all, I must say that Cocker Foundation and Heart of Asia Society have done a great job by bringing different scholars and practitioners together to revisit our history. I had a chance to write my reflection uh, for the Persian volume of this, this book. And now it's a true honor to discuss letters exchanged by, um, between President Najib and Professor Cocker with a group of very dear friends and uh, scholars. So let me now respond to your question in two parts. First, I will try to talk um, about how the letters can help us to understand Afghanistan and the way intellectuals framed discourses and how um, politicians and intellectuals converse with each other, uh, taking this case, um, taking the conversation between Professor Cocker and Najib as, as a case. And second, um, I will move on to speak about um, uh, whether a kind of public consciousness around the values and the content of the Republic has advanced far enough, as you asked, that can um, toward off the return of an emirate or probably um, a kind of collapse into civil war. So now first, um, for me personally, these letters represent a kind of a microcosm of the history of Afghanistan by which we can understand the dynamism of uh, somehow the entire modern history of the country. Um, what do I mean by that? So let me explain that by four points um, quickly. Um, number one, um, this is a conversation, of course, between an intellectual and, and a politician, but uh, specifically, here Cocker is a symbol of intellectual in exile. And, and, and if you look back at the history, since inception of intellectualism, uh, constitutionalism, and an and effort uh, of intellectuals for democracy, and probably, let's say, republic, as you asked, um, they were sent in exile. Um, at the current juncture, uh, if we speak about the last 20 years or probably now that we are, uh, of course there's a democratic setup, but, but there is also a toxic environment where intellectuals may not have enough capacity to speak the truth to the, to the power. Um, that means that they are mentally in exile now at this moment. Um, so to give you one example on on 18 April 2021, and just last month, uh, President Ghani stated that, that the ones who are not with the Republic has no place in the government, right? So this, is a, this was somehow a very clear message. Um, either you are with me or you're against me and redefining the boundaries of the Republic um, and make it, making it so much personalized, right? Um, now, what are the possibilities that probably now intellectuals debate or reflect on republicanism or the, the political order that, that we aim for. Um, of course, there are alternative platforms or probably what we can say counter publics. A uh, very recent one uh, that I have observed is, um, uh, is, um, is a pla new platform which is created online where people can speak directly uh, with each other, Clubhouse. Um, so that there, and you can see that the yacht, the woman activist, um, and human rights activists, those who are somehow concerned with the values like liberty and equality, coming and debating most of these issues together. Now, second, as this volume is uh, named In Search of Peace, um, we can see throughout the history, politicians reaching out to intellectuals in search of peace. Well, these are the war and conflict is initiated by politicians, of course. But once there is a stalemate, they come back to intellectuals. Like, let, let me give you a couple of examples from the history before Kokar and Najib. Um, good example is, for example, Mahmoud Bekhtarzi, 
who was sent in exile by Amir Abdurrahman Khan, and then he was invited back um, during um, Habibullah. Ghobar was internally displaced and sent in exile. Later on, Zahir Shah invited him to contribute to the 1964 constitution, same, same as with so many other intellectuals who were working in the circles like Awakened Yacht or Watan Party in 1960s or 50s. Um, now, what was the response? What is the response of the intellectuals now that they receive invitations? Um, when you read the letters exchanged between Najib and Cocker, of course, Pro Professor Cocker rejects the invitation and he questions the legitimacy of the of, of Najibullah, um, the way that sovereignty of Afghanistan is undermined, the identity has been redefined, and how he doesn't have that uh, that capacity to to lead the peace process, right? So somehow I see the same such kind, the same kind of movements um, of rhetorics at the moment, where President Ghani's legitimacy has been questioned just because he has not been true to the Republican values, right? Um, uh, the way election was conducted, the way uh, the corruption is there, the way uh, the entire Republic is personalized. So I will come to that in, in, a, in a while, but somehow um, you see a continuation again. Third, um, these letters are somehow also conversation between a person, two people, um, not two institutions. That that can also give uh, give us something about history of Afghanistan. Uh, later or these letters are full of emotions. They are not official. They are unofficial, uh, and that that is the way politics is framed in Afghanistan. P uh, politics is really uh, the, it has been a rationalized or institutionalized practice. It's it's so much personalized relationship between politicians and others. Um, so it's not just about how politicians shape these politics, but also in intellectuals like uh, diasporic uh, community and intellectuals who are in, who were in exile, like Professor Cocker. They also did not initiate such kind of associations or institutions to 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 um, to connect back to the to, to homeland, right? So same as now, you, what you see the status of activism when it comes to public intellectuals, uh, you do not see lively institutional uh, behavior or probably associations or institutions to bring together intellectuals to reflect on on the um, political system or values or republicanism. Um, so that, that's all about the first point. Now let me come to the second point um, about the question that you raised, um, whether a kind of public consciousness around the values and the content of the republic is there or it's advanced or not. Now for me, unfortunately, I'm not much optimist on this. Um, the current juncture is somehow, with the discourse around these concepts is somehow very nice. It's very, it's like in a BB stage. Uh, so let me give you, again, back to reconnect to history. Um, early this week, um, Hashtra Sob Dili, it's a popular newspaper in Afghanistan, celebrated its 15th anniversary where a group of friends and I spoke about rule of three prominent intellectuals. Uh, uh, one historian, of course, um, Ghulam Muhammad Ghobar, Rahnawa Daryab, and Qasim Ahgar. So while the legacy of these figures are lesser known to the Western world, uh, but they have played a notable and noticeable role in debating and, and fighting for the rights, liberty, and equality, uh, which constitute core values and the content of Republic. Now, for example, one of these intellectuals, um, Qasim Ahgar, he demised in 2014, the same year that Professor Kokar passed away. Um, now, to what extent now we connect uh, to, to the values um, that was campaigned or advanced uh, by most of these intellect intellectuals like uh, Qasim Ahgar or Kokar? Uh, unfortunately, we have done, well, I mean, uh, when it comes to um, enlightenment or values like liberty and equality, there is not much advancement, but we have done great job when, in, in, other, in other areas and in, in the last 20 years when it comes to knowledge production or probably in sports or IT, it's very good. But the discourse of Republic um, somehow now at this juncture was articulated and framed as negotiations got momentum in September 2019. So it's, it was somehow abrupt. All of a sudden it came up. Um, and it's also, that's one dimension of it, that um, the, the establishment tried to establish this discourse 
first of all, against the Taliban, but at the same time, it was not just Republic versus Taliban or Emirate, but at the same time, there was also a domestic enemy to it. And by that, the establishment tried to target all those political opponents who were in Kabul, for instance. Now, some of the content which is developed around the concept of Republic is somehow reactionary. Um, it's not conceptualizing this idea, but reacting to what uh, government is doing. For example, let me give you three, and I will end with that. Um, once, when I earlier cited one of the quotations from President Ghani that he said, either you're with government or if you're not with the Republic, you should be out of the state. Now, some of the, some of the public intellectuals, this, they came up, let me quote one of them, that one of uh, the poets wrote, uh, wrote that Afghanistan has three sides. It's not two sides, Emirate versus Republic, but there are three sides, the Republic, the Emirate, and the sheeps. The sheeps here uh, was a metaphor of the common masses, citizens, who were betrayed by politicians when it comes to Republic and democracy. The second one is, um, there's a famous now statement here in Kabul which says the Republic of Ethnocentrists, um, Jumhuri, and Farsi. And the last one is, of course, Jamuri Senafara, which is a republic of um, triplet, uh, three people, that's a prison Ghani and the Edis. Um, so so that some, you see that how the discourse is, it's, uh, it's not much mature enough. Uh, and the last point that I will end here, I, uh, I think, is that, of course, we should not forget the role of international funding and international partners in shaping these discourse. For example, most, most recently, the U.S. Embassy, the past section, Public Affairs, they have released a call for proposal which is worth over $2 million, uh, which calls for proposals like on the topics like national identity, national solidarity, uh, and all these values. So to what extent you, you see here how youth investment, despite the fact that they deny that they are not engaged in nation building, however, lots of funds, uh, as a case, for example, is spent on this, or for example, how um, mass media has been funded to, to take such kind of public debates and bring popular intellectuals um, uh, in front of the people. I will end here. Thank you so much, and I will be happy to take questions later. Thank you so much, Omar. Let me come, uh, Bob Cruz, to you next. Uh, you're a historian, and so I was struck by the cautionary tone of your essay, which warned us not to overdo the comparison between the current moment and that of 1989. You pointed to this remarkable transformation um, that has taken place in Afghan society, and you described the emergence of multiple publics where new forms of expression and collaboration and contention thrive. Can you talk to us about what the existence, albeit tenuous, of these publics mean for the state building and war fighting that continue in their midst? And how might you imagine the Taliban would contend with these radical new developments? And finally, what opportunities do you think they offer to the world's other democracies to engage Afghanistan as one of their own? Great. Uh, thank you very much to Polly. And thank you all. It's a great privilege to have the opportunity to um, to learn from my colleagues from Afghanistan. And of course, thank you again, Mr. Kakar, for including me in this enterprise of trying to make sense of, uh, of your father's important letters to Najibullah. As, as Polly noted, um, there are lots of parallels to think about. I think that uh, Ambassador Brahimi's comments on that are, are still very useful. I think for me, looking at it from afar, looking at it as a historian, looking at it from California, so with all those important caveats attached here, what strikes me in, in looking at Afghan society over the last 30, 40, 50 years is really the, the dramatic changes that have swept this landscape since 2001. Here, I, I don't mean to engage in, I know a lot of Americans um, tend to have a very kind of um, idealized view of the American impact. And I'm not, I wanna be clear that I'm not claiming a story of progress and of a kind of unitary trajectory toward improvement and reform and in a way that, that makes uh, apologies for all the American policy mistakes. So I wanna be clear that I'm not suggesting that <clears throat> the American impact has been solely magnanimous or progressive. What I mean to suggest is that the, the American invasion and then occupation or presence, however one defines it, created a space for all kinds of changes. Um, and as Omar Sadr noted, these changes built upon 
a very rich and complex and sophisticated intellectual history. Uh, all the historians you cited are, of course, important landmark figures in, uh, in thinking about um, constitutional foundations for uh, Afghan statehood, for thinking about national identity. And of course, uh, Professor Kakar played an important role in all those debates. So 2001, to my mind, marked a kind of break, but one that was partial and that it, it drew upon the very rich cultural, intellectual resources of, of Afghan political thought. So in my very brief essay, I try to highlight a few areas among many that one could highlight to understand the processes of change that made the society so different from that that uh, Najibullah and Prescott Carr tried to understand in 1990. So in my essay, I, I highlight the role of the media. And here again, I'm echoing some of Omar Sadr's other comments. This mediascape is quite expansive and, and remarkable um, in that it has brought together this dynamic diaspora together with very hardworking, very courageous journalists on the ground in Afghanistan. And here too, I don't want to paint a wholly idyllic picture because of course, Afghanistan is one of the world's deadliest environments to engage in journalism. I'll come to that point in a moment. So this is not a kind of utopian mediascape, but it's one in which I argue that certain publics have emerged. And here I haven't used public in the singular. I liked Omar's references to different kinds of actors because I think I'm trying to get at something similar and then find that there are multiple groups in Afghanistan. And from my point of view, looking at it again as a historian, I appreciate Omar Sadr's critique of this, but to my mind, I see something actually quite productive in the in what I would call the diversification of the Afghan political landscape and of its um, pluralization. And here, not everyone's rowing the same boat in the same direction toward our republic, right? Many are moving in different directions, but I think that that pluralism, that heterogeneity, that diversification that we see expressed in media are all actually quite productive things in thinking about peace because they're in a way modeling by engaging in public debate through social media, through old media, through radio, through television. And here I recommend my friend Wajma Osman's book on Afghan television, which is really a brilliant and, and very careful uh, examination of the ways in which these spaces have worked to advance new ideas under very real constraints, under foreign pressure of funders like the United States, but also under um, armed uh, you know, militias and powerful businessmen who don't want certain things being said. So it's a very messy sphere, but I think that what, what is so, I think, particularly productive for us in thinking about peace is the way this mediascape has created space for new voices to emerge. And to me, the most exciting new voice is that of youth. And here, I say youth in the singular, I actually mean plural, because these are actually quite heterogeneous voices. And I've been very grateful to learn from, for example, representatives of the Hazar community who have made religion a, a subject of, of these you know, public debates. Um, and one finds very uh, important uh, claim making that Hazar intellectuals make about religion. Uh, as you all know better than I, Shi uh, Islam has achieved a new institutional setting uh, in Kabul in particular, but throughout Afghanistan since 2001, which is another major kind of landmark of change. And yet for many Hazara intellectuals, there is a kind of ambivalence about an ambivalence about identifying with Shiism. Um, they recognize that Sunnism is also an important feature of, of many Hazar communities. And broadly, there is a, a kind of rethinking in the diaspora and elsewhere of the possibility of agnosticism, of religion, but also irreligion. So this kind of pluralism has also seeped into the religious sphere, not just among Hazaras, where I've been looking at this most closely, but we find this across communities. We find it among women, women who've been drawn to Salafism, who find a kind of activism, a kind of feminism, in religious practices that push against the idea of the Republic perhaps, but which are quite dynamic in our expressions of, again, claim making and of a kind of political engagement in, for example, projects of reform, as they put it, to use the language of reforming the, the Afghan woman, reforming Afghan society as mothers, as activists, as religious experts as well. So that feature of, of mediascape, of youth, and then of new religious ideas are all, I think, important points to consider when thinking about how much Afghan society has changed. Uh, in this brief essay, I also note popular mobilization, that is street politics, street protests, the use of public spaces as a new kind of uh, claim on public um, politics, on engagement, on trying to in carve some path of participation uh, in this state. Uh, finally, I, I point briefly to a fascinating realm of aesthetics. We can point to filmmaking, to poetry, to uh, novel writers, uh, to the support world of journalism broadly, um, just people's you know, personal aesthetics. All this has changed so dramatically. And to get to Dipali's question, most importantly, 
it, how this all relates to state making and war making in the Taliban, I would just say briefly this, that in its current form, the state has not created avenues for these publics to engage, for them to participate. So this is I think, a major critique, a major source of frustration for youth and for all these kind of alternative publics who want to have a stake in the shaping of the state, but who are precluded by this very narrow, closed system of politics that currently exists, which is a major impediment to mass mobilization, not just the legitimacy of the state, but of mobilizing all these voices who actually want to engage in some kind of democratic politics, who want to participate, who want to shape the future of Afghanistan. How the Taliban will relate to all this is, of course, remains to be seen, but I think one, one important index of this is, is the violence we've seen in recent weeks against Hazaras, for example, at Dashtabarchi, and then all these half stations of, of young journalists and young media figures. I think here, this violence against Hazaras and against young media people is an index of the danger that the opponents of the current system see in these dynamic figures. In other words, they see them representing an alternative political order and they want to wipe this out. So I think that that's a kind of measure of the importance of these groups. That is the violence uh, waged against them is an index of their significance and why we must think about them. The Taliban have adapted in important ways in thinking about you know, creating an image that will be more palatable to, to Afghans uh, in the future. And they've done, I think this in a quite sophisticated way with their vast media apparatus to adapt a nationalist rhetoric and at the same time to adapt a, a new technocratic language very much modeled upon the United Nations, upon an, an NGO uh, landscape in Afghanistan. And yet here too, I think there's an interesting mirroring here that is problematic because when the Taliban speak about new forms of rule that they will, you know, they, they won't repeat the same mistakes and so on, they adopt a kind of NGO language, which thinks of politics as a kind of bureaucratic technique, not as political participation, as engagement, as contestation. So that kind of mirroring, the, the kind of denial of politics is something that the Taliban, I think, have replicated in talking about how they will perform differently. Um, and so there's a major tension here between the, the pluralism that has emerged in Afghan society and the very narrow strictures that the Emirate proposes for the future. So that I think uh, both sides, both for advocates of the Republic and for of the Emirate, how to accommodate this pluralistic, more diverse environment is really, I think, the fundamental challenge of, of peace building for both camps. Thank you so much, Bob. Bill Keith, let me come to you. You and your co-author write about the grave suffering that Afghans experienced first on account of foreign interference during the Cold War and then foreign neglect after Soviet withdrawal. As the U.S. draws down its remaining forces, I wonder if you can talk to us a bit about the possibilities for this moment to be different. Can we once and for all bring this devastating cycle of occupation and then abandonment to an end? You also detail the many complex social, political, and military roles that Afghan women have long played, even as their contributions are often left unwritten in the histories that we read. You know, it's impossible not to notice today that some of the most powerful advocates for a sustained U.S.-Afghan relationship, one of partnership and respect, are Afghanistan's women's activists. So I wonder if you can also share with us a bit about their vision of what a new kind of partnership between our countries. Thank you. Thank you, DePauli, and also thank you to Cocker Advocate uh, for allowing me to share my personal views here uh, and also on the book. Uh, so unlike others, I see many similarities in the direction Afghanistan is headed uh, to. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that today's Afghanistan is vastly different from that of the 1980s. The political and security situation in Afghanistan is directly affected by the geopolitics of the region. Uh, the conflict there is not only a domestic issue. Uh, the tension between Pakistan and India directly impacts the Afghan situation. Uh, on the other hand, tension between um, other countries, uh, such as Iran and U.S., and also U.S.-Russia, has had in the past and continues to have a negative uh, impact on the Afghanistan's politics. The India-Pakistan tension have become more contentious, uh, in my view, compared to that of the 1980s or four decades ago. Um, and fortunately, most Afghan uh, leaders in the recent decades have uh, lacked long-term vision uh, for the stability and prosperity of the country. 
where there has been uh, a visionary leader, uh, the regional powers have silenced them. And somehow a visionary and patriot Afghan leader is perceived as a threat uh, by the country's closest neighbors. Uh, so how can things be different? We are where we are. I think for a stable Afghanistan, a number of uh, commitments must be made. One is that the most important one is that the regional powers must end their proxy wars in Afghanistan. And they must come to the consensus that political crisis and middling in the country's affairs and uh, is going to further destabilize the region and also their own countries. And they must stop meddling in the country's affairs and stop supporting the war profiteers. Uh, they must also replace their divide and conquer uh, policies and efforts with cooperation, economic prosperity, counterterrorism, and counter narcotics. Uh, they should come to the realization that those Afghan leaders and factions who choose personal party and factional interest over the will of uh, their own people, Afghan people, are not worthy of support. On the issue of abandonment, um, the last time the US decided to uh, step back uh, from Afghanistan in the 1980s, the Afghan people ended up paying a tremendous price. By pulling back its support to Afghanistan and Afghan people, the US and the West left a vacuum that was filled uh, by disruptive forces such as Al-Qaeda and also other neighboring states. Uh, so uh, the Afghan government needs, at this point, uh, strong commitments from the international community regarding continued support in the development of Afghanistan and also in securing uh, the country and protecting their own people. On the issue of um, Afghan women, uh, Afghan women like women elsewhere um, have played and continue to play multiple roles, both passive and active, in either building peace, preventing violent conflict, uh, from escalating at local and tribal level, and also providing logistics uh, support to warring factions. There is no secret in that. This was true in the 80s, and it's also true today. Uh, you asked about the uh, vision of Afghan women. I think um, the vision of Afghan women is clear. They want peace. They want an end to the war, they want economic prosperity, democratic principles, and better life for their people and for their children. They're a force that deserve to be supported and protected by international community. But most importantly, they deserve to be respected and protected by Afghan politicians and men. So for us, um, the choices are clear. We can either abandon the people of Afghanistan, just like we did in the 80s, and watch civil war and humanitarian crisis unfold before our eyes, and start all over again when the country is used to threaten our national security. Or we can help uh, Afghan people to overcome the challenges and rebuild their communities and their country. I could be biased, but the uh, resiliency of Afghan people and girls is a source of inspiration and courage uh, to money in the world. The two major organizations uh, that have either claimed responsibility or stay accused of orchestrating attacks on schools and educational institutions are Taliban and ISIS today. Both have inflicted unspeakable pain, including bombing hospitals and schools. But at the same time, we have seen video clips and pictures that the day after each attack, teachers report to work, 
and girls go back to school. That's what I mean by resiliency. I hope the international community shows the same kind of courage as that father who walks his daughter to school the day after the attack. I do see our role uh, and moral obligation to not let Afghanistan go back to the civil war just the way we watched in the 1980s. So the, the direction we are going, in my view, is um, not all that optimistic, but the end doesn't have to be this way. Thank you, Dipali. Thank you so much, Bill Keith. Uh, before I come to Omar Sharifi, let me just remind our audience that you can ask your questions by using the chat box function. Um, Omar, let me come to you for the last comments. Your scholarship as an anthropologist, including your essay in this volume, details the means by which Afghanistan emerged, thrived, and survived as a nation, even in moments like the one after 1989, when the state itself collapsed. Many people look at Afghanistan in this moment, and they fear that it sits on the precipice of another such collapse. Can you tell us how you assess the health of the Afghan nation in this moment? And which pockets of the society do you see as carrying a sense of national attachment that can weather these difficult times. In your essay, you note that no Afghan faction, including the Taliban, has ever sought to break apart Afghanistan. And I wonder if you think this resilient sense of connection could be the basis for a more stable, sovereign government and lasting peace going forward. Um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Pauli. I mean, I, as a last speaker, I know I mean, most of the important things I've already said by the other speakers. But first, I'm very privileged to be here with um, some of the kind of major um, scholars and politicians who have played an important role in, um, especially in the post-2001 um, Afghanistan life, which I was kind of part of it. And I grew up especially uh, reading and listening and um, Ambassador Brahimi and others somehow. Um, so it's a privilege for me to be here in this sense. Now, your question is kind of a, a tricky question because um, if I understood it right, um, the assumption right now is um, that um, we are actually fragmenting again across the ethnic lines. And that is the reality of at least um, the um, other side of the line, the anti-Taliban forces. But, uh, but uh, I can say that in the context of the book and in the context of what I'm experiencing today here as anthropologist, I believe that there is absolutely a consensus across all ethnic groups in Afghanistan, within the North and South, about um, not letting Afghanistan turn into something, another bloodbath, another kind of a dark, go back to the dark era of the Taliban period. People remember that. Now, I see also that for a lot of internationals and for a lot of nationals here, um, they somehow see um, the palace as representing, for instance, one ethnic group and Taliban representing another ethnic group, or, or, or like the, the power is technically divided across the ethnic lines. First, in my opinion, uh, in Kabul right now, what is sitting as a government, um, I don't see them as kind of representing sort of a, for instance, Persian, Persian constituency or a Taliban representing Persian group and stuff, as much as the other groups kind of representing the entirety of their groups. What we are actually facing is today is the consequences of about 20 years of mis, kind of mismanagement and sort of misperceptions about Afghanistan. So remember that um, in when, when we were in the kind of on the verge of um, um, drafting our first constitution, um, people, both internationals and uh, our experts here, in a way, didn't want to trust the local wisdom and the local and the people's sort of intelligence to allow to kind of allow some level of devolution of power. So the people in the local localities actually have the right to 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 um, select or elect their, their 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 governors, their mayors. And they represent his father government. And they thought that in a way they in, instead they somehow mostly kind of relied on the most 
available a strong one or another crony from Kabul administration to literally put on there. And at the same time, the way that the, the, the law, the kind of the constitution of Afghanistan was organized is like they didn't allow 20 years ago for the political parties to actually compete as political groups for the government. So the natural sense that in a way, the natural space in which the people, irrespective of their uh, um, 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 a kind of locality for them to kind of mobilize themselves and in a way channel their political their frustrations was to go through the locality use ethnic use sort of regional or sectarian sort of um, a space in which to kind of express themselves and so so what we're seeing today is one of them on the other hand what we're seeing today in Kabul right now in the confrontation between um, uh, different political groups including the people in the palace, as Dr. Marsal says, the Tremavirate, Tremavirate, I don't know how to pronounce it, the Republic of the Three People and stuff, is actually also a contest about the channeling of the resources and power. This is a moment of crisis in a sense, and these groups want to take power. And so in a way, the ethnic, and because of the lack of any other political sort of establishment, ethnicity, at least on the surface, somehow become a, a narrative through which the elite in Kabul, um, 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 in a way, bargain about division of power and stuff. At the same time, what we see that whole ethnicization of politics in Afghanistan was not something that is completely on to come from the Afghans. In 2002, when the international community came, a lot of us actually didn't even how to speak English, let alone be able to express ourselves what we want. So the assumption was Afghanistan is sort of a Balkan. And then even like the original communities, I remember the uh, um, uh, General Musharraf, the, uh, the former dictator of Pakistan, actually came in 2003, I suppose, and actually called the Taliban as representative of the Pashtuns. While the Taliban may come from the Pashtuns, but actually they do not represent the Pashtun majority or the Pashtun groups in general and stuff. So, and, 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 and the people bought it. I remember like even officials, both in the internationals, and within the Afghan um, government, which was predominantly in that time was ruled by the Afghan diaspora, we actually saw the Taliban as the Pashtun sort of a representative of the Pashtuns. And that sort of discussions continued. Now, 20 years later, well, where are we standing today? Now we have a voice. I see absolutely, in, and based on my working with as, as, as a professor, seeing that there is a sort of a, um, uh, um, um, a constituency across ethnic lines, across sectarian lines, about preserving some of, preserving like the democracy and the civil rights that we have. And, and not because it's just simply come off with the inter intervention of the internationals in 2001. We have a century of sort of like that type of movement and the height of it was 50s and 60s. And that assumptions and now the international community are about to leave, at least they have to live with that kind of an assumption that that sort of movements are not just emerged in 2002 in order to be silenced and completely destroyed after 2000, after, 2000, after their departure. That will definitely continue, in my opinion. Now, will we ever, will we collapse into ethnic lines? What is actually clear? That the extreme centralization of all the authorities and every decision making by a small group of people, palace or in Quetta Shora, in both cases, and no, and not leaving a space for the different kind of diverse communities of Afghanistan to actually have a voice in terms of like what they want, obviously may sound from the outside. It obviously may trigger this more of a crisis and stuff, and 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 in a way give this image that we are completely fragmented across ethnic lines. But also based on our kind of understanding of history and how Afghanistan emerged, specifically as a nation state, um, it kind of says that to no ethnic group. If at first there is, I don't see Afghanistan as like made of ethnic blocks in which like they compete like Serb Serbs and Croats and Bosnians and Albanians and others. That sort of things that, that the merger, the kind of the connection between different groups in different regions of Afghanistan is far more organic. And the Taliban may push that idea that we are sort of, they, 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 though they never sort of um, take that um, uh, flag of like, oh, we are completely standing for a specific ethnic group. But they target, for instance, the House of the Shia community in Afghanistan to actually further sectarian things. But even with the vicious and inhumane attacks that happened, we don't see any sectarian things, sectarian crisis by Sunni and We actually see that a lot of Sunnis take place and with the Shia community in Afghanistan. So the picture is not just ethnic blocks of fighting each other. What we are facing is, is today that there is a consensus among the majority of the Afghans 
were irrespective of their ethnicity, about kind of uh, about this being living in a civil society, in a civil sort of environment. And that will continue whether international helps us or not, but I hope very much they help us. Because it's the crisis of Afghanistan, the tragedy of Afghanistan is not just for the Afghans, it's also for the end for the world. And I think the 9-11 actually proved that once. Thank you. I think I'm on time, right? Thank you so much. What incredibly rich contributions from the four of you. I'm going to now pass it back to Ambassador Olson so that we can get some comments from our... Uh, thank you, Dipali, and uh, thanks to all the panelists for a uh, really wonderful set of remarks. Um, I'm going to take, uh, I, I would uh, urge our audience to um, use the chat function uh, to send in questions. We have a few, uh, but I'm going to take the, the moderator's prerogative to ask the first question to get us going. Uh, this, this session has been conducted under the penumbra, obviously, of the history of 1989 to 1992. Um, and its applicability to perhaps uh, the current situation in Afghanistan. Uh, the parallels are obvious, the withdrawal of foreign forces, the role of the neighbors, there are many uh, more uh, uh, an uh, analogs that one could come up with. But of course, um, analogies are tricky uh, and they tend to break down when one gets into specifics. But I wonder if I could ask the panelists um, if it is useful to be thinking of the current situation uh, in Afghanistan in terms of what happened in 1989, 1992. And are there any specific lessons that could be drawn for policymakers right now uh, from, from that period? So why don't I, why don't I open it up? Um, and uh, and um, all of the panelists are welcome to address that. And then we'll go on to questions from the audience. Omar Sadr, did, uh, did I see you looking like you wanted to perhaps take a shot at this one? Okay, so let me jump in. Uh, well, there are parallels that we can draw between the two end of conflict, uh, end of Soviet invasion, and end of U.S. intervention. Uh, first of all, just recently, um, um, one of the uh, one journalist in Kabul translated um, 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 a diary of um, ISI in general, which was written at the end of uh, 80s, I think. And that narrates the history of um, you know, Soviet invasion and how Pakistan-backed uh, insurgents, Mujahideen, um, against the communist government. Uh, so the findings of that book um, uh, somehow tells us that there are so many similarities. First of all, uh, the way insurgents were backed, and the pro they were proxies. They were uh, there were sentries across the border. They were financed, uh, and ideologically they were trained. Same as what the, uh, at, the, at this moment Taliban has, uh, has are doing the same thing that Mujahideen were doing earlier. Um, the other side, um, uh, one of the key causes of the collapse of um, so, um, the Soviet-backed um, Kabul regime was, I think, at the end, it was ethnocentrism of it. Um, the, the regime didn't fall apart because of uh, the army was weak or probably um, uh, financial support. Of course, financial support continued for two years, but one of the key factors um, behind the fall of Kabul was uh, and the ethnocentrism where the uh, Watan party uh, was divided between and the Tajiks and, and, and the others who um, one backed Jamiat party and the other backed um, um, Hezb Islami. So now at, at, you, you can see the same thing now, the ethnocentrism uh, around prison Ghani um, and, and the toxic environment which has been reproduced, regenerated, reinforced unfortunately through social media platforms. Uh, and in some cases you see um, um, uh, statements of racism. So, um, to me, I think it, even it's worse than um, uh, 19, in 90s because back then there wasn't so social media and platforms to to, uh, to reach out to the masses, but now there is. Uh, but at the same time, there are differences also. Um, I think um, back in the 90s, and the Kabul government was abandoned by the international support and the USSR. 
But now, um, despite the fact that you is pulling out, but there is a commit, continuous commitment that government will be financed. Um, uh, there will be humanitarian aid, developmental aid, and diplomatic support, political support. And that was quite clear uh, from the U.S. side, also European Union. Uh, so that's the difference. Uh, second is, of course, I think what um, uh, Dr. Robert Crew also mentioned that we have, of course, the generation which is produced in the last 20 years um, who are much well aware now of the certain values, um, the way identity is divided, divide, uh, and, and how to preserve these values. What I referred earlier in my intervention was, of course, not these things. I, I was talking about intellectualism and the way um, ideas are framed and um, produced, mobilizing and counter-mobilizing ideas. Uh, and on that part, of course, there are problems. But I mean, the level of uh, public awareness is much more higher. Um, the, the third one, I think the third similarity would be if in case uh, there would be a continuation of crisis from, from September 12 onwards, we will have probably uh, a mass exodus, um, a refugee crisis in the region because uh, the, the politicians, unfortunately, at the moment, doesn't have the capacity to lead and unify the factions and groups together. Their rhetoric and their political behavior is unfortunately dividing. Um, it's not the fault of people, it's fault of the elites and those who are in government that um, they cannot unify them, um, all of us. Uh, and uh, of, unfortunately, that will have an extremely negative impact when it comes to, uh, to the societal um, cohesion and, uh, uh, and some, somehow unity of the, uh, of the people. I will stop here, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omar. Um, and, and do any of the other panelists want to take this one on? Or yes, uh, Omar Sharifi, please. And thank you. When I was um, just about the similarities and differences in this specific case, when I was reading the letters between Dr. Kokar and Dr. Najib, in as an Afghan, when I was reading this, there is an understanding that both sides, in a sense, and also from the majority sides, they all have some sort of like a kind of a, a, a memory of a pre-war Afghanistan. They sort of, um, there is an understanding among both sides at what Afghanistan was before, how it worked, what was the idea of the state, how the institutions were working, what kind of society we had. There was some sort of what you call it like a historical conscience about it. And when they, even when we read in other contexts like Dr. Najib's exchange of letters with some of the Mujahideen commanders of that period, we see that the same kind of historical conscience existed between these groups. Today, what we are facing is I mean, when we look, read, and specifically for me, who I actually grew up under the Taliban, and the first-hand experience, their, their, their rule and their, their regime, what we're seeing here is, is sort of a disconnect between what President Ghani talks, what the Afghan government talks, what the Afghan society talks, what the international community says, and the Taliban leadership. Because I do not believe personally that the ISI training camps and the Haqqani madrasas in Peshawar actually raise people who actually have a historical consciousness of who are. Majority of the Taliban leadership. And I'm not talking about just their fighters and others who may have some local connections, but the leadership, including the Haqqanis, they grew up in that environment in which, especially even in the 1990s, when I was like asking the Taliban about how they imagine Afghanistan stuff. There is a break. There is no, there's a very little to no sense of like his connection with the history, with the culture of Afghanistan as we might. And even if you look at the Taliban propaganda, Taliban and the Taliban and Pakistani supporters sort of and posts in the Twitter or Facebook and everything else, there is not a single reference about, for instance, when the Taliban fight the Americans, there is not a single reference about, for instance, the Afghan history, about like how in the, during the Anglo-Afghan wars, uh, the Afghans were fighting against the British. They're completely using a very jihadist narrative that was common in South Asia and the Middle East and stuff. We don't see that, things. There is a disconnect. To me, that is... Some, that's kind of a major difference in terms of it's kind of psychological, anthropological way of looking at how the group, in a way, shape their narrative. There's a much more international jihadist discourse 
within the Taliban. And while well, the Mujahideen had a complete reference all the time, most of the time they were referencing. And the other things, if you look at Afghan history in a sense, during the Mujahideen time, we never had a suicide attack. And actually, if you read the entire Afghan history until 1982, there was not a single Afghan national hero as a martyr, no martyr or shaheed, as we call it, ever sort of celebrated in the course of Afghan history. Uh, because it was kind of all the one was the country, the Ghazis, which is like the victorious living warrior was celebrated in the course of Afghan history. Today, what we're seeing in the Taliban narrative, beside the suicide bomber, is absolute celebration of death. Something very not based, rooted, or related to the, the way that the Afghans, in a way, looked at their history and tried to define themselves. So these are sort of, from a psychological, social perspective, I see that difference in a sense. And also, there are some, there are some similarities, but the similarities comes when we look at the second tier, third tier of the Taliban. So the fighters and commanders who are most local based, and there is a way that they can connect with it. And obviously, it was mentioned when the Taliban, when the Mujahideen took power in 1992. The intellectual community of Afghanistan was wiped out. Majority of them were assassinated in 1989, 88, 89 in Peshawar, who like, or they left for the West. The same campaign that happened a few months ago in Kabul, an assassination of journalists, writers, thinkers, and stuff. But today, despite all of that, there is a sort of a community of the Afghans who actually can think, and more importantly, they can talk to the international community. That we didn't have in the 1990s. We have to rely on I others. To try it. May I have a, a quick intervention? I'm yes, Rose. please, go on. One of the biggest lessons, and perhaps in my opinion, yeah, the biggest lesson that can be drawn is that the war cannot be the answer. I think in the 90s, the Mujahideen side, they thought actually war could be the answer. And now, even though <clears throat> what we saw is that they could take over Kabul and the rest of the country, but what they ended up was not the Kabul as it was in the 90s, but it was actually a destroyed Kabul. And if that can be the biggest lesson, and these days, different parties are actually playing lip service to that and saying, yes, we do want a political settlement, but it's not clear if they were going to be ready to make the compromises necessary to take uh, the make a political settlement. And number two, move forward on the political track before it's too late. One of the things that has been said about uh, Dr. Najibullah's uh, overtures that the reason it failed is because maybe it was just too late for him. That it was not, it had, because be, before it becomes too late and parties have made uh, their own other uh, plans, it's important to move forward. So if the war agenda can be taken off the table, then that would be the biggest lesson that can be learned not only for Afghans, but for the regional countries as well. That's all I would say. Thank you, Colin. I would like to get a couple questions in from the audience, if I could. There's um, uh, one from uh, Anna Syed. What is the role of indigenous collective action movements in this peace process, and how important is it to engage with them actively? And sort of a related question from Hila on what would be the actual mechanisms that one could envision uh, for bringing about an inclusive peace process. So in the first instance, I'd like to um, pass those to um, uh, Professor Cruz uh, and to uh, then to Belkis. Oh, sure, thank you. Um, a very challenging question, and I, I would defer to my Afghan colleagues, I must say, but thank you for directing that to me. I think, I mean, draw upon the resources of, of critical engagement that we see Afghan youth and intellectuals um, engaging in. I think the, the practice of, of street politics, of popular mobilization uh, has been quite striking. The, the Hazara Enlightenment Movement, the mostly Pashtun um, peace convoy. I mean, these demonstrations of, of public action, I think are, are quite effective and I think are not entirely new, but I think the scale is new, right? So we, we, we saw demonstrations in the 50s and 60s and 70s in Afghanistan, but I think the scale is different and the, the extent of mobilization partly aided by social media like you're new, and these are again modeling peaceful collective action, peaceful demonstrations that I think are. Um, to be sure, we, we we find other moments of, of kind of violent, you know, rioting, and that's that's a, another kind of broader um, challenge. But I think most of what we've seen over the last twenty years are you know a series of uh, very peaceful demonstrations, and it's often been the state that has introduced violence to such scenarios. So I think, in a way, I, I look at this again as a historian looking at it broadly. Um, I see a very productive way that. 
looking comparatively, other societies, including my own, have employed to try to seek change. So there, I think it's, again, I think a lot of when we talk about Afghan politics, we think about the kind of pathology and we critique and we find um, shortcomings and we find areas to criticize. But here, I think this is a, a process that since 1960s has shown to be effective on a global scale from Paris to Mexico City and beyond that collective action taken to the street, using you know public spaces as a kind of theater to express politics is quite um, productive and is an alternative to the kinds of violence that we've been critiquing today. Okay, yeah, I'll go next. Uh, so this is uh, somehow related to the previous question. I think uh, today Afghan youth, men and women, at local level have uh, initiated and continue to implement peace building efforts, vision building for the future of their country. Uh, and then all of that, women and girls uh, play a critical role. This is a sign of grassroots uh, up, you know, I don't want to call it bottom up, but basically that's what I mean, efforts that are ongoing in order to build peace uh, from the very grassroots level. And those efforts need to be kept uh, authentic and also organic and also be supported uh, to take root. On the issue of um, mechanisms, I think now it's clear after uh, almost six or eight months of uh, negotiate the start of negotiations in uh, Doha, there is a need for a mediator. I think a mediator that po both parties, Afghan government, that all of one can agree on, is necessary in order to move things forward. Uh, agreeing on a uh, ceasefire, it could be uh, partial or a reduction of violence, whatever you want to call it that's measurable, needs to take place so that people can have confidence in the process. Right now, Afghan people are left in an environment, in a situation that they're of anxiety and certainty. They don't know what will happen the next day. Uh, there are inconsistencies and contradictory statements by international partners that further adds to the level of anxiety and certainty in Afghanistan. So all that needs to be considered. The Afghan, the Taliban have to come to the table if they are genuinely committed to a peaceful resolution of conflict. You cannot hold negotiations with an empty table and chair. They have to be there in order to move the talks forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Balkis. Um, uh, we now uh, turn for the closing words to um, Ambassador Janan uh, Mosesai. Um, I think um, I'm going to just uh, pass it uh, to you, uh, 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 Janan. Uh, Janan and I were colleagues in, uh, in Islamabad. He's had a very distinguished uh, diplomatic career, uh, and he is now working on civil society issues in Kabul. So over to you, Ambassador Mosesai, for the last word. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rick. Uh, I think it's difficult to offer any closing remarks at the end of uh, such a rich and uh, engaging panel, uh, especially with the presence of uh, Mr. Brahimi and all the other distinguished speakers. Uh, I will just maybe say a couple of, highlight a couple of points, given the fact that I probably only have a, a couple of minutes. Uh, one such fact is that past efforts uh, seeking a, a peaceful settlement in Afghanistan not only uh, in the 1980s, but also during the 1990s between the different Mujahideen factions and also between the Mujahideen and the Taliban have largely been failures. And that's mainly because uh, different Afghan sides have tried to monopolize power for themselves and trying to brush other groups aside based on a zero-sum mentality. And this was obviously, as has been pointed out many times, including by Mr. Brahimi, uh, a cardinal sin of the post-2001 political system that excluded the Taliban. Today, as was pointed out, the context is radically different from 20, 30, or 40 years ago. Uh, however, we have a situation where the U.S. is on the way out in an unconditional manner. Uh, the Afghan government, one domestic side of the conflict, has been prepared for talks for a long time. But the Taliban, on the other hand, wants the Afghan government to surrender. They have not presented, the Taliban have not presented anything by way of a peace plan that envisages a shared future with the existing Afghan government, and more importantly, the Afghan people, 
which today includes millions of educated young men and women, as was pointed out across the diverse Afghan population, that does not agree with the Taliban's extreme ideology and who want to stay connected to each other, to the region, and to the rest of the world. And uh, as citizens who want a future of education, freedom, and progress. And as Dr. Sharifi pointed out, uh, Afghans agree not only on peace, but also on living in a civil society. And yes, as Mr. Brahimi pointed out wisely, peace needs time in Afghanistan. However, given the state of play right now, where we have escalating levels of violence on one hand, a near total deadlock on the negotiations front on the other, and given the looming deadline of uh, U.S. complete withdrawal by September, a sense of real urgency and it must be brought to bear on efforts to jumpstart the negotiations track, and that's where the role of the region, the United States, the European Union, the European Union becomes key. Uh, and they all have uh, influence over the domestic sites, but also on the region. Uh, one point that wasn't highlighted, but I think I will mention it, uh, is the necessity of a mediator, uh, an effective mediator, and that's where the role of the UN becomes key. But obviously, the UN will need a clear mandate and a strong support from the UN Security Council to make sure that this time around, the UN's role does not end in failure as it did during the Geneva experience, and that we have strong and firm regional and international guarantees for an Afghan peace settlement. With that, I would like to uh, join uh, my USIP colleagues and colleagues at the Cocker History Foundation to thank all our participants for a fantastic uh, conversation today and uh, invite participants and viewers to uh, read the books that are available for free download from the websites of the Heart of Asia Society and the Cocker History Foundation. And with that, I wish uh, all of you um, a good health and, uh, uh, and a great day, a great morning, a great evening, wherever you are. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ambassador.